Hi, welcome to the video on chapter 14, Correlation and Regression. In this video, I'm going to cover correlation, and in a subsequent video, I'm going to look at regression. Um, so we, we've seen correlations before. We're familiar with the idea. Uh, we're looking at a number that describes a relationship between two different variables that are coming from one person. Um, so we're looking at the characteristics of this, uh, the, the dynamics of this relationship. Um, and this, uh, the number that we're looking at is looking at the direction, the form, and the strength or consistency of that relationship. So the direction is either positive or negative. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the next couple of slides. Uh, but this, this number would have a positive or negative indicating whether it's a, a positive uh, dynamic or a negative dynamic. And um, the correlation that we're going to look at, uh, specifically, we're going to consider a linear form. Um, when we're thinking about the various models or patterns that, that exist in, uh, in data. And also we're looking at the strength or the consistency of that, that dynamic, okay? So um, this is, uh, actually I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in the next slide, or the next two slides. Uh, so here we have a, um, some data, right? So we have family income and student average, average grade for uh, individual students, you know, persons A, B, C, uh, all the way down through N. Uh, so each dot represents one person, right? So they have a value along the family in uh, the x-axis and one along the y-axis. On the x, we have family income, and on the y, we have students' average grade. So you can see here that there appears to be a pattern uh, linking family income to students' average grade, right? So it appears that as family income increases, so does the, the students' grade. So we can see that that there does appear to, to be a, a linear relationship here. Um, so here are examples of the positive and negative correlations. Uh, in diagram A, we have time spent studying on the x-axis, and on the y, we have performance in class. So you can see that as a student spends more time studying, that their performance in class looks to be increasing. Uh, there's a, the dots, they're, you know, uh, pretty clearly representing an, a line that's sloping upward. And in diagram B, we have smartphone use on the x-axis and performance in class on the y-axis. So you can see that as students are using their smartphones more, their performance in class is actually diminishing, right? So there appears to be a linear form sloping downward, right? So this is, these are what we call the positive and the negative correlations. The positive, the variables, they'll change in the same direction, right? So as one is moving, uh, uh, higher as one is increasing, the other one is also increasing. But for negative correlations, they're moving in, in opposite directions. So as one is increasing, the other one is decreasing. So there are other uh, patterns and models that um, appear in uh, the real world and data, but we're really just going to be looking at uh, linear patterns. And there are correlations that can handle some of these other patterns, but we're just going to be looking at the Pearson correlation. So the Pearson correlation, um, as I mentioned, is just looking at um, a linear relationship between two variables. It, it's a number that goes from negative one to positive one, uh, negative one being a perfect negative correlation and positive one being a perfect positive correlation. So here we have examples of the Pearson correlation and what the data would look like. So in diagram A, we have a perfect negative correlation. So that's a negative one. And you can see that the dots are all um, aligning on that uh, perfect line. Um, in diagram B, we have a correlation of zero. And you can see that, that there's no correlation, either a positive or a negative one. The, the dots are uh, just kind of scattered and, and uh, you know, no apparent linear uh, relationship if you were to to circle these dots with the with what they call an envelope you know, these uh, uh this red line here you can see that it's a circle right so it's like the opposite of a line uh, down here in diagram c we have a positive correlation that's close to being perfect 
you can clearly see that there is a linear pattern here sloping upward. So that corresponds to about 0.9. In D, we have uh, what appears to be a negative correlation, but it's not very consistent. It's uh, negative 0.4. So let's go back up to diagram A. You can see that um, as X moves one unit as uh, up, Y moves one exactly one unit down, right? So that's what makes this a perfect linear relationship is that they're moving at basically uh, the, the way that they're changing is equal, right? So they're both changing by a unit of, of one, right? So in this case, Y is moving in, in the opposite direction. So that's why we get the negative. But um, regardless, their, their variability is equal, right? So uh, that's important to keep in mind. Um, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the consistency of the relationship. So if you were to, to look at diagram C, for instance, you can see that we do have what appears to be a line moving upward, but it's not, the points are not exactly falling on the line, right? So um, as X is moving upward, um, and it's moving upward, uh, like in a way that's, that's varying, right? So um, as it moves up, the y, yeah, it does tend to go up, but it's not moving, it's not perfect in the way and the amount of units that it moves upward, right? So it's, uh, you know, it's changing. It's, you know, uh, sometimes x is moving up and, and we get a y that's below the x. So it, the, this dynamic is not as consistent. So uh, theoretically, and conceptually, when we're thinking about the Pearson correlation, we're measuring the degree to which uh, these dots fall along a straight line. So we do that by, uh, by setting a numerator, by creating the proportion that has a, a numerator, which is the extent to which X and Y are varying together. And we set that over the degree to which X and Y are each individually varying. Okay, so the top part we call the covariability of X and Y. Um, so you can think about that uh, by thinking, by considering uh, the diagram A and C, right? So um, in the top diagram that we were looking at where the dots were falling along a straight line, the their covariability, how they're varying together was, was perfect, right? Like it was a, uh, a they, were, they were changing in the exact same amount, right? So you can think about, how they're changing together, but each one of those is a variable, a separate variable with data in and of itself, right? So um, the X also has its own variability and the Y also has its own variability, right? So we're comparing these two things, right? The covariability over the individual variabilities. The numerator, we call the sum of products and then the denominator, we just have the sum of squares, right? So we have the sum of squares for X and the sum of squares for Y. So remember that the sum of squares is just a measure of variability for that, that variable. And we're putting that in, into the square root. Uh, so the sum of products, as you'll see in the uh, slides up ahead, is also conceptually almost exactly the same thing as the sum of squares. Uh, so the sum of products, the sum of products is a sum of uh, deviations from the mean, right? So look, uh, look at down here at the formula. We have the definitional version of this. So you can see that we can take the variable x and find its mean and then subtract the mean from every uh, value, right? Every x value. And that's something that we've already been doing in the sum of squares. And then over here, we have the y and um, we find its mean and subtract the mean from every uh, data point in the y as well. So this is uh, conceptually what we've already been doing with the sum of squares. So there's also a computational definition of uh, the sum of uh, products. So you can see that it also looks very similar to what the sum of squares formula. So here we have the sum of x times y, and then we uh, subtracting a fraction, which is the sum of x times the sum of y in the numerator set over n. So uh, let's compare these formulas so that you can see that we're basically just doing the same thing. Uh, 
So let's look at this uh, top row. So we have the definitional formulas on the left column and the computational formulas here on the right column. But let's examine just this first row. So here we have the, the sum of squares, right? So the definitional one was that we were just subtracting the mean from each value uh, and squaring that and then um, and then adding up all those uh, all those numbers, right? So uh, when we wanted to use a computational formula, we just have the sum of x squared on uh, the left and we're subtracting uh, the fraction, the sum of x, that quantity squared, uh, and then setting that over n. So we've seen these before. So if we were to expand these two formulas, right? So this is, uh, this is a squared, which means that we have this term twice, right? If we were to expand these, it would look like this. So that, are, that looks like the sum of products definitional formula. If you look down here, right? So we're basically doing the same thing, just that um, now we're just this other um, term here is being replaced by the y term. Um, and then if we were to expand this one, you can see that, that we have something that would look like this, which of course looks like the sum of products formula down here. Uh, we're just swapping out this x with a y and swap, swap, swapping out one of these quantities with the y quantity. So our fi final formula is looks like this. So it's a sum of products over the square root of the sum of squares of the x variable times the sum of squares of the y variable. So it's a very simple formula that we can follow. We already have an idea of, of where these two things come from. And uh, so conceptually, this should not be too difficult uh, to grasp. So how do we use correlations? So we can use correlations for prediction. Um, so typically this is what correlations are used for. So if you have a pretty good uh, relationship between two variables, you can predict the value of one variable based off of another one, right? So uh, if we know that they have a pattern, you can uh, uh, take an X uh, variable and then uh, take something along the X axis, I mean, and be able to make a prediction of what that y corresponding y value would be. Also, we can do things like uh, check validity or real reliability. Um, so validity just means that you, whatever you're measuring, you're actually measuring that that thing. Uh, so, for instance, if you were measuring IQ, you could take one IQ test, and whatever result you get, um, if you if you administer a different IQ test there should be a correlation between those those two tests, right? So there should be a strong uh, relationship with that because if you're administering two tests to the same person, that same person's intelligence isn't gonna change, right? So you can check validity uh, through correlations and you can also check reliability. Uh, so reliability measures how consistent um, the measurement is, how stable the measurements are. So uh, again, you could measure some kind of um, characteristic like IQ, and if you if the person takes like a you know a specific IQ test and they get uh, you know oh their IQ is a hundred, so if they take that same test later on, like maybe six months later, there should be a relationship between those those two outcomes, right? So um, that could also prove reliability that 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 instrument is consistent. Uh, so lastly, you can use correlations for theory verification. Uh, so if you have some variable, uh, for instance, like you think that um, that there's a connection between family income and how well a student does. So if you find the correlation between those two things, then you can you can prove that yes, like family income does affect. Uh, how well a student does in, in their academic performance. So as far as interpreting correlations, uh, the important thing to remember is that correlations do not equal causation. So in order to, to establish a, a cause between two variables, you have to set up an experiment. Uh, so we talked about that in the first uh, part of the semester. So you can just the only thing you can derive is that there's some kind of connection between the two variables, but you can't determine which one causes which one or whether maybe there's some other uh, factor that is causing both of them. Uh, 
so for instance, this is a, a, a the famous example of showing that as number of churches increases, the number of serious crimes also increases. So the amount of churches within a certain town uh, probably has not that much to do with the, the number of crimes, but uh, towns that are really large, well, whose population is, is pretty big, are going to have more churches, and they're also probably going to have more crime, right? So uh, even though there is a, an apparent relationship between these two things, we can't say that one is causing the other. So another thing to consider when we're interpreting correlations is that if we're working with just a restricted range of data, um, we, we have to be very careful about what we're able to conclude. Uh, so we can only make conclusions about the range of data that we're, that we're looking at. Um, so take a look at this uh, example here. So we have um, a set, uh, uh, some data that if you kind of look at the whole data, you can see that there is a linear relationship, a positive correlation. But if you're just looking at a restricted range, uh, from here where this uh, dot dash line is to, to the right, you would you would take a chunk of the data that makes it look like there's no relationship, like there's no pattern. And also there's outliers. So there could be data points that just don't follow the, the pattern, or maybe there's no pattern, but the, the data point makes it appear as if there is a pattern. So typically, these are data points that are either really big or really small. And uh, that's why it's important to always look at uh, your data visually, just so that you can see whether there's uh, one of these outliers or, outliers or not. So if you look at diagram A, uh, you can see these dots. They're not really scattered in any kind of pattern. And the you, you have a, what is like a really tiny... Uh, negative correlation, but overall the Pearson correlation coefficient is close to zero. So there's pretty much no correlation here. Um, and you can see the data here at the bottom. So in diagram B, uh, we can see that now we have a Pearson correlation of 0.85, almost a perfect cor a positive correlation. And all they did was just add one, one extra data point here, um, F, right? So they added 1412 and that outlier now makes it look like there's actually a, a pretty strong positive correlation. But of course, there really isn't. Um, so one final thing about interpreting uh, the correlation. So the, 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 the correlation uh, is not telling us how much one variable is accounting for the other. Uh, it's just kind of measuring that those three things that I talked about earlier. Uh, so R squared, which conceptually we have already talked about before, which is the um, the amount of variance that is explained in the uh, dependent variable by the independent variable, uh, you know, just in general terms. We've spoken about that before as a, a measure of effect size, right? So um, here, we have conceptually pretty much the same thing as well. Um, we have the coefficient of determination, which is R squared. And, uh, and it is the same R squared that we've talked about before, but it's being applied to, to, um, in this situation, right? So now we don't actually have a, an independent variable that's being controlled and manipulated that's producing a dependent variable. So we just have two variables that are related to each other, but we can still uh, use this R squared in order to determine how much of the variability and, and the Y is determined by, by the X. So for instance, if we had a correlation of 0.8, um, our R squared would be 0.64, right? So, or 64%. So we would be able to say that 64% of the variability in the Y would be, is able to be predicted uh, from the relationship with X, right? It's, it's coming from X. So here we have in diagram A, uh, shoe size being compared to IQ scores. So obviously there's no relationship between shoe size and IQ scores. So the R is zero and R squared is also zero, right? In diagram B, we have IQ scores and college GPA. 
So as expected, there is some relationship between these two variables. Uh, I, IQ scores can, to some extent, predict the variability uh, that you can find in college GPA. So the R is 0.6, um, uh, you know, a positive correlation, a positive linear dynamic. And R squared would be 0.36 or 36%. So um, the var this variability in college GPA can, in part, be predicted by IQ scores, uh, it's, uh, precisely at 36%. Right? So 36% of college GPA can be predicted by IQ scores. Of course, there's other factors that, that contribute to college GPA, right, other than just IQ. Um, and then lastly, we have monthly sal salary uh, compared to annual salary. So there's a perfect correlation here, and 100% uh, of monthly salary can be predicted by annual salary. So that's it for this um, lecture on correlation. I, I'll put up a couple of videos as well, uh, going through some examples, um, and then there will be a part two uh, looking at regression. Okay, so see you in part two.